But first of all, Isaiah chapter 7, beginning at verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. From Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. key verse there is verse 21. Let's read it together. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now only God can do that. Only God can save us from our sins. And Jesus is God. Benjamin Russell Hanby was born July 22nd, 1833. He was the eldest of eight children born to Bishop William Hanby in Rushville, Ohio. The family moved to Westerville, Ohio when Bishop Handy, Han, Handy was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. In his short lifetime, Benjamin, that eldest son, graduated from Otterbein University, taught school, became a United Brethren minister, started a singing school, uh, was editor of John Church Publishers in Cincinnati, and composed many songs and hymns before finally dying of tuberculosis at the age of 34. His home in Westerville was Ohio's first memorial to a composer. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad for slaves escaping to Canada and is a national historic site today. And there is also a Methodist church landmark in that place. There is a Hanby Residence Hall in Otterbane, Res uh, university, and um, this man is best known, believe it or not, for what song? Not Jingle Bells. That's the first or the eldest, the oldest song related to Christmas, dating back to 1857. If you can't guess it, it's up on the housetop. Hanby published many hymns, including Little Eyes and Who Is He, which appeared in the Dove 
a collection of music for day and Sunday schools in Chicago in 1866. And in case you're not as familiar with that last carol, who is he? Here's the words. Who is he in yonder stall at whose feet the shepherds fall? Who is he in deep distress fasting in the wilderness? Then the chorus or refrain follows, "'Tis the Lord, O wondrous story, "'tis the Lord, the King of glory. "'At his feet we humbly fall. "'Crown him, crown him, Lord of all.'" Now there were some second graders, they were talking about Santa, whether or not old Saint Nick was real, and one of them said that at one time he doubted Santa was real because his cousins had told him so. And so the next time he was at the local shopping mall, he ran up quietly behind the Santa and gave him a swift kick in the leg. Naturally, the Santa let out a resounding shriek and the boy said from then on he knew that Santa was real. Now another child confessed that she was not sure if Santa was real, but she added that she would never confess her doubts publicly uh, because her older sister had announced that she no longer believed in Santa. And at that time, she ceased getting toys and only started to receive clothing for Christmas. Now in this younger sister's mind, it appeared that Santa had turned on her elder sister and that was not going to happen to her, she was sure. Well, this Christmas, we can be mistaken about a lot of things. Uh, what gift to get for a loved one? What courier to use to send a long distance gift? UPS, FedEx, or UP USPS? We may be mistaken about the best time to avoid the crowds at the stores. What Christmas card we just remembered we forgot to send, or what menu to have for our Christmas dinner. And as important as all these things may seem to us or to our families, they fade into insignificance when compared with the most critical and ultimate question that must be asked. And that's the question that Benjamin Hanby's hymn makes in the question, who is he in yonder stall? If we miss answering that question, about the baby in the manger, or just as sad, we answer it incorrectly. The implications are enormous. Here's what we miss. We miss the Messiah, God's anointed one to deliver us from sin. We miss salvation. We miss eternity and glory. We miss God's gift. We forfeit the salvation of our own eternal soul, and not only that, but by our influence, we may cost the souls of others for all eternity. Somebody surmised that the two most frequently asked questions in heaven will be, what are you doing here? And the second is, hey, what happened to so-and-so? Well, that speculation has a ring of truth about it because even Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, Matthew would have us know that uh, there is certainty and uh, he would not want that to happen to any of us. Matthew would make a good Sergeant Joe Friday of Dragnet because what he records are just the facts without a lot of commentary. So if your mind this morning has been overwhelmed with the pressures and the responsibilities of recent weeks and your body is a bit weary and needs rest, then sit back and let Matthew simplify what is most important about Christmas. The baby in the manger is the God-man. Did you hear that? Amen. The baby in the manger is the God-man. He is both divine and human, two natures, combining in one person. And when we hear Matthew, Matthew investigates Christ's deity so that we have a clear picture about Christmas and don't miss out. Matthew says that the virgin birth of Jesus Christ reveals his deity. That is, it reveals that Jesus is in fact God. Matthew states that a young virgin named Mary was betrothed or engaged to a young man named Joseph. 
Now, in the ancient world, and I hasten to say a world that was much more normal, virtuous, and sane than our present day world, parents arranged marriages for their children. That's right, you didn't have a choice. It was done for you by your parents. They had a level head on their shoulders. They made decisions of such consequence that you would not be led astray. So they picked your mate, not you. When children became of marriageable age, they entered betrothal, or the engagement or espousal period. And customarily, a man was about 18 years of age, and a woman was in her very early teens. Now, before marriage, they would not live together. That was unaccept unacceptable. They were expected to refrain from sexual relations until after the wedding ceremony. Yet the year of engagement, or the year of espousal, was so sacred that the couple were, again by custom, considered as if to be already married. They were referred to as a married couple. And Matthew states that very clearly that Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph and before they came together in intimate relationship, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now as Christians, we have traditionally labeled this account the virgin birth of Christ, right? It is a cardinal doctrine in the Christian faith. And the reason it is, is because of its importance. But the modern skeptic to the modern mind, which is totally conditioned by the permissive culture in which we live, move, and have our being, this truth about Jesus seems highly suspicious and improbable. To which we answer, okay, there are two options. Either Mary was a virgin or Mary was not a virgin. If it is assumed that she was not, then there are two more options. Either she had relations with Joseph or she had relations with another man. Yet nothing we know of Mary suggests unfaithfulness to Joseph and nothing we know about Joseph suggests that he would deny responsibility if, in this matter, it were truly his responsibility. If, on the other hand, all scripture is inspired by God, and if God is not a man that he should lie, then Mary did not have intimate relations with any man, and that she indeed was a virgin at both the time of conception and at the time of Christ's birth. Amen. How is it possible? Well, there's only one explanation. It's possible because of God. With God, nothing shall be impossible. And then looking back to Isaiah's day, we find a clear prediction, a, prophesy, a prophecy that Jesus would be born of a virgin. King Ahaz had already decided to rely on Assyria for protection from the approaching armies rather than trust God. He refused any confirmation that God offered him, whether it was in the depths below uh, hell or in the highest heaven. With false piety, he refused to ask God for a sign. So God said, I'm going to give you one anyway. A virgin is going to conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. And before that child reaches the age of accountability, when he knows and can distinguish between right and wrong, probably age 12 or 13, the two nations that Ahaz was in such a tizzy over would be wiped off the face of the earth. But in the long term, that sign offer of the virgin giving birth to a child pointed to something much greater. It pointed to the true Emmanuel. And the virginity of his mother was vitally important since Jesus Christ could not be conceived by the Holy Spirit and at the same time have a human paternity. 
It had to be one or the other. And according to Luke's narrative, even Mary was dumbfounded at this. And she asked the angel, how can it be since I don't know a man? I've had no relations with a man. And Luke tells us the angel said the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power uh, of the highest will overshadow you. Does the Holy Spirit come upon us? Does the power of the highest overshadow us? Son of God is a Hebrew idiom, and it basically means possessing the nature of God. Without his deity, there is no explanation for the virgin conception and birth of Jesus Christ. That's the first point. The second is that Matthew makes it crystal clear that Jesus' mission demands his deity. What did Jesus come to do? He came to offer himself a sacrifice for sinners. The angel reassured Joseph that Mary had not been unfaithful and that she would deliver a child and you would name him Jesus for he would save his people from their sins. Only God can save. There are going to be no people in heaven because a millionaire gave God a large sum of money. Won't happen. God already said, the silver and the gold are mine. I don't need yours. And the Bible says, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But Jesus' name means God saves. And both his name and his mission confirm his identity as deity. Jesus Christ must be a divine savior for at least two reasons. Think about this. First, A, the Bible says that by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be saved. Have you heard people come to you and say, my gospel, my religion is the Sermon on the Mount? Sorry. You can't keep it, and nobody before you can keep it, and nobody after you will keep it. If your religion consists in the Sermon on the Mount, you are under a false presumption. The real function of God's word is to make me recognize and be conscious of my own sin. And the more I know about God's word, the more I see my sinfulness, you say. The Bible says, the entrance of your words gives light it gives understanding to the simple. The Bible sets the goalpost, which is the law, and then it shows how far short we come. The reason our society is so adamantly demanding less and less Christian influence In, America, in American life is frankly due to increased ignorance of what the Bible actually teaches. Now I'm sure we've all heard people who presume they know the Bible uh, about this or that topic and what it says simply because they can spout off a few familiar phrases. God is love. Judge not lest you be not judged. Neither do I condemn you. Come to find out that these same quotes are used by them to defend a whole host of lifestyles and choices which defy God and God, God's law. It only proves that people are missing the point of Christ's coming. 
They're not listening to the whole counsel of God. And the whole counsel of God is, God did not come to make you happy. He came to make you holy so that you would live and spend eternity in heaven, not on earth and not in hell. Many simply don't understand that what is holding them is much more serious than they think. What's holding them captive is Satan. Satan has them in his grip. You remember the witty comedian and actor, W.C. Fields? He led the typical Hollywood lifestyle a fondness for alcohol and women. He was not known as a religious man, but as his death approached, he began to peruse the Bible. And one day a friend saw him doing this and commented on his odd behavior. And W.C. Fields explained, I'm looking for loopholes. Bible doesn't have any. Doesn't have any loopholes. The Bible says very frankly and very clearly, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It, it can't get any simpler. It can't get any clearer than that. If you miss that, you miss everything. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. If Jesus Christ was only a mere man, then he could not pay the penalty of sin. We'd never be saved because the penalty would never be paid. If we are to be saved from sin and its consequence, eternal hell, we need a savior who is outside of the realm of humanity, and yet a man who can get the job done and can get it done without taking eternity to do it. So that 1 John 3, 2, the Apostle John could speak of the moment, the present moment, today, December 18th, 2022, and he could say with certain certainty, Beloved, now are we the children of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we will see him as he is. The second reason, B, that Jesus must be God in order to save us, is related to the first. Romans 8.3 says, For what the law could not do, in terms of securing our salvation, in that it was weak through the flesh, or its power was hindered by our entire nature, our sinful nature, the nature we've received from Adam, you see. God, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, meaning that Jesus was a true man, he came in a body, he lived in that body, just like you and Mike, except for one thing. He was sinless. And as a person who is sinless, he offered, he made an offering for sin, and in doing so, he condemned sin in the flesh. Whenever an animal was sacrificed in the Old Testament, it represented an innocent animal dying in the place of sinful man. That's what Jesus did. He condemned sin. I get a kick out of people saying they're going to have a funeral, but it's going to be a celebration. No, folks, there is no celebration in death. The Bible calls it the last enemy. Don't call it a celebration. Jesus died so that you could live. 
And many soldiers, we know, sacrifice their physical lives for the nation in a time of war, and we call it patriotism, right? But sin creates a penalty before God's holiness, and that penalty is such that it's not confined to this life. It reaches beyond this life into eternity where we suffer. Unless the Savior steps in to deliver us so that the righteous requirement of the law would be fully met, paid in full, so that we're no longer bound to the law, but free to walk in the Spirit. One of my favorite poems is The Raven. Edgar Allan Poe was one of the most tragic figures in all of American literature. His parents were actors, but they were penniless. He went to live with strangers at a very young age, and the atmosphere of that home was absolutely deplorable. And then on top of all of that, the one true love of his life died and left him a broken alcoholic. Is it any wonder that most of his writings are filled with despair? Following the death of his wife, he wrote that poem. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. Well, the story that unfolds is filled with grief over the death of his beloved Lenore. And the word that echoes through almost every verse of that haunting poem is the word nevermore. And then he ends, and my soul from that shadow that flies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. You know what, I wonder this morning how many people are sad, depressed, lonely, crying out for hope in spite of all the lights, all the glitter of Christmas. And they're, ac they're actually asking, is there anything beyond all of this? I mean, is there, is there something beyond the grave? Will I live again after I die? Will I see my husband, my wife, my son or my daughter, my mother or my father? With all the craziness in the economy, and in the government, will I ever have a sense of lasting peace? We'll now contrast that poem with another poem written by Virgil Brock about a century later. During the summer of 1936, the Brocks were visiting Horace Rodever at the Rodever School of Music in Winona Lake, Indiana. And one evening, the guests were sitting out and they viewed a spectacular sunset that couldn't stop, uh, they couldn't stop talking about its incredible beauty. A large uh, area of the lake's surface uh, appeared ablaze with the glory of God as the sun was setting, and yet at the very same time, there were storm clouds gathering overhead. And uh, 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 as the guests were having uh, dinner, Virgil's cousin Horace Burr, who was blind since birth, spoke with great excitement, saying that he had never seen such a beautiful sunset. And curious, one of the guests said, how, how, how could you see it if you're blind? And Barr's reply was, I see through other people's eyes. And I think I often see more than they do. I see beyond the sunset. And Virgil wrote of that incident that someone then raised the question, I wonder what's beyond all this. You know, like you do when you see a sunset on a beautiful summer night. And immediately the answer 
began to form in Virgil Brock's mind, and he later put it into words, beyond the sunset, O blissful morning, when with our Savior heaven is begun, earth's toiling ended, O glorious dawning, beyond the sunset, when day is done. And then verse 4, beyond the sunset, O glad reunion, with our dear loved ones who've gone before. In that fair homeland, we'll know no parting beyond the sunset forevermore. Jesus was born for you to be able to say that. He's authorized, and he's the only one authorized to save. Was it for sins that I had done he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. You see, Mary and Joseph each made a decision independently about that yonder stall, that one in the stall. Even before they arrived in Bethlehem that night, and that's what helped them overcome the physical disappointment of having to wait. It helped them overcome their own crushed emotions. It helped them overcome public ridicule and scorn. The answer could only be that this was no ordinary conception, no ordinary birth. It was, in fact, God. Emmanuel. This was God himself. And the question you must ask, and the question that your loved ones must ask, your grandchildren must ask, your brothers and your sisters must ask, your sons and your daughters must ask, is this. Who is he in yonder stall? Eternity rests on that. Are you finding him to be the helper in your daily problems and perplexities? Are you finding him helping you in your praying, your serving? Here, are you becoming a part of the plan that Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? If so, if you can say that, you're beginning to experience the outstanding privilege that goes with the responsibility of being led by the Spirit. And the Bible says, all who are led by the Spirit are the true children of God. That's your deposit. Your deposit from the bank of heaven, from God himself, he gives you the Holy Spirit as his child. And that's what prepares you. That's what enables you to set aside all of the worldly infection and to come quietly and to kneel at the manger and to kneel at the cross where that manger led and to say, yes, I know that my Redeemer lives. <laughs>